Section 9.3, separable equations. A separable equation is a first order differential equation in which the expression for dy dx can be factored as a function of x times a function of y. So whenever we have a product of functions of x and y in our differential equation, then we call that equation separable. This also works for quotients, as we'll see from our first example, because we can rewrite quotients as products by taking the denominator and splitting that into its own fraction. So we could rewrite this as 1 over y squared times x squared. So it becomes a product, and thus it is a separable differential equation. So let's uh, do an example real quick of that. What we'll do is we will take the y dx and we will treat it as if it's a fraction. So we'll cross multiply and we'll do that in order to separate dy dx into dy and dx and we'll separate the x squared function from the y squared function or the 1 over y squared function. So if we multiply both sides by y squared we get y squared dy and we multiply both sides by dx and we get x squared dx. Then we integrate both sides. So we integrate y squared dy and we integrate x squared dx. And then we take the antiderivative. So we get 1 third y cubed plus c equals one third x cubed plus c, but because we have c on both sides and they're potentially different c's, I can take all of the c's on this side and subtract them and move them to the other side to combine to get one, like you would call it like a super c. So I'll just leave c over there where this c is equal to whatever constant I get when I integrate minus whatever constant over here I get when I integrate. So then I just solve for y. So I multiply by 3 and I take the cube root and I get that y is equal to the cube root of x cubed plus 3c. But 3 times a constant is just as arbitrary as another constant. So how about I just rename that? I can say that this is y equals the cube root of x cubed plus k where this constant k just replaces my 3c. So in order to solve any separable differential equation, all we have to do is cross multiply and then integrate and keep careful track of where our c goes. Notice in this case, c was inside of the cube root, not outside. Let's find the solution of this equation that satisfies the initial condition y of 0 equals 2. So that'll decide what k is. We have y of 0 equals this thing if we plug in 0 for x. So plugging in 0 for x gives us 0 cubed plus k, so all we get is the cube root of k. But they also told us that y of 0 should be 2. So if y of 0 is 2, that implies that the cube root of k is 2. So that implies that k is 8, which is cube both sides. So we can replace our equation, or just replace the k in our equation, with y equals x cubed plus 8 and take the cube root. Let's do another example. How about we solve the differential equation dy dx equals 6x squared over 2y plus cosine y. So again we'll cross multiply we get that 2y plus cosine y dy is equal to 6x squared dx. We integrate both sides now we get that the integral of 2y plus cosine y dy is equal to the integral of 6x squared dx. So we integrate 2y, we get y squared over 2, the 2 cancels, so we get plus sine y and then plus c, but I'll, again I'll move the c to the other side, so we just have 1c 
and we get 2x cubed plus c. In this case, we have y squared and sine y instead of having y by itself. So this is an implicit solution for a differential equation. In fact, it's actually impossible to solve this one explicitly. So we'll just leave it like that. Let's try solving the equation y prime equals x squared y. So we'll write dy dx instead of y prime so that we could use Leibniz notation in order to separate our differential equation. And we will divide by y and multiply by dx. So we get dy over y equals x squared dx, assuming that y is not equal to 0. If y is equal to 0, notice that you can plug in 0 over here. And you get that uh, y prime, which is 0, is equal to 0. So you can see that even when y is 0, it's a solution to the differential equation. So we don't have to worry about it. We can just assume from now on that y is not 0. So we have the integral of dy over y equal to the integral of x squared dx. So the integral of 1 over y is the natural log of the absolute value. And then we, on the other side, we get uh, x cubed over 3 plus c. Again, we group the c's together. So let's see. If we've got natural log equals this thing, then I can write that the natural log of y is equal to e to the ln of the absolute value of y. So what I'm basically just doing is taking e to both sides of this thing. So I get that that's e to the x cubed over 3 plus c. So by laws of exponents, that's e to the c times e to the x cubed over 3. So the absolute value of y was equal to that. So this is the same thing as saying that y is equal to plus or minus e to the c times e to the x cubed over 3. And as before, we verified that y equals 0 is a solution to this differential equation also. So we could get rid of e to the c, because e to a constant is just another constant. And we can call it a new constant. How about a, to make this as general as possible? So we get that our solution is e to the a e to the x cubed over 3, where a is equal to e to the c. Uh, it could be equal to e to the minus c, or a could even be just equal to 0. In section 9.2, we modeled the current I of t in the electric circuit shown in the figure by the differential equation L times di dt plus ri equals e of t. Let's find an expression for the current in a circuit where the resistance is 12 volts, the inductance is 4 henrys, a battery gives a constant voltage of 60 volts, and the switch is turned on when t equals 0. What is the limiting value of the current? Well, they told us that the inductance is 4 henrys, so that means that L is equal to 4. They also told us the resistance is 12 volts, so R is equal to 12. And our uh, voltage is constant 60, so E of t is 60. So now we'll rewrite L di dt plus ri as 4 times di dt plus 12i equals 60. And we just solve for di dt. So we get di dt by itself is equal to 15 minus 3i. So that means that our problem becomes di dt equals 15 minus 3i with the initial value i of 0 equals 0. So how about we integrate both sides? If we integrate um, di dt, well first we should multiply by dt on both sides, sorry. So we get di and we'll group together the i's so we'll divide by 15 minus 3i. 
So I'll just do that both at once. Multiplying by dt on the other side and integrating, I just get the integral of dt. You always want to group your variables together, just like when we had x and y separated. We would group together the dx with all the x terms and the dy with all the dy's. So in this case, we do dt with all the dt's, and there aren't any. And we do the i's with the di. So we get the integral of 1 over 15 minus 3i. We can do a quick mental u substitution. It's 1 over u, so it's the natural log of u, but then there's a minus 3, so we have to multiply by minus 1 third. So we get minus 1 third times the natural log of the absolute value of 15 minus 3i. And that's got to be equal to integral of 1 is just t. And we'll put all our constants on one side. So let's keep going. We will multiply both sides by negative well, by negative 3. So we get natural log of 15 minus 3i. But at the same time, how about we just raise both sides to e to cancel out the natural log. So we'll get 15 minus 3i in the absolute value is equal to e to the minus 3 times t plus c. Just multiply both sides by negative 3 and then raise both sides to e. So let's get rid of our absolute value now. We get that 15 minus 3i is equal to plus or minus e to the minus 3 times, well, actually, how about I separate this? I can distribute the 3, so I get e to the minus 3c, and then it's plus e to the, well, it's uh, plus inside of the exponent, so that means I can multiply by laws of exponents. So I'll multiply by e to the minus 3t. And then, as before, I'll rewrite that e to the minus 3 as its own constant, uh, put the a instead of e to the minus 3c, and I'll keep e to the minus 3t. Then let's solve for i. We get that i is equal to 5 minus 1 third a e to the minus 3t. So now let's use our uh, initial value. We know that i of 0 is equal to 0. So that implies that 5 minus 1 third a is equal to 0. Right, because e to the minus 3 times 0 is just 1. So we solve for a, we get that a is equal to 15. So that means that our equation for i is now i of t is equal to 5 minus 5 e to the minus 3t. So that's the solution to our initial value problem. The other part of this question as to what the limiting value of the current was. So let's just take the limit real quick. Get that the limit as t goes to infinity of i of t is equal to the limit of this thing that we just solved for. 5 minus 5e e to the minus 3t. And that's 5 minus 5 times the limit of e to the minus 3t by our limit laws. So this limit, though, is like 1 over some giant, giant, giant number as t goes to infinity. So that's 0. So we have 5 minus 0, which is equal to 5. And you can compare this to when we did this problem in section 9.2, and we actually took a look at the graph, and then we saw that the limiting value from the, sorry, not the graph, the slope field was equal to 5. And now we've actually gone and computed the solution and verified that it matches our slope field. An orthogonal trajectory of a family of curves is a curve that intersects each curve of the family orthogonally, that is, at right angles. So looking in our figure, we have a whole bunch of orange curves. They're all very similar to each other, so they're a family of curves somehow. They're just, you know, maybe differ by a constant or something. And we have a green curve that cuts through all of those curves at a right angle. 
So that green curve that slices through every single one of those curves at a right angle is an orthogonal trajectory. Just like we can have a family of curves though, we can also have a family of orthogonal trajectories. So we can have another one, for example, like that, which also cuts through at all right angles. So what we're gonna do is uh, an example where we find the, all of the orthogonal trajectories, the entire family of them, for a family of curves, x equals ky squared, where k is an arbitrary constant. So the picture will look a little bit different, but uh, the process is basically we need to come up with a differential equation because differential equations in the form give us a derivative somewhere, and derivatives gives us slope of tangent lines. So if we can find the slope of all of these tangent lines, then what we can do is we can take those tangent lines and look at the line that goes perpendicular to those, the other tangent. That other tangent will be the tangent to the orthogonal trajectory. So first, let's find the slopes of all the tangent lines, the curves in our family. So if we have x equals ky squared, we need to get a differential equation out of that. So how about we take derivatives of both sides? We'll get one, taking dy dx of x is just one, and then two times y on the other side using implicit differentiation. So we'll multiply by dy dx, and we'll keep our k. So we get two ky dy dx. So then we can solve for dy dx. And we get that dy dx is equal to 1 over 2ky. So this means that if x is ky squared, I can solve for k and see that k is equal to x over y squared because our derivative is in the form of 1 over 2ky instead of just being a function of y. We don't want to have to deal with k when we're solving for our slope because it shouldn't depend on k. It should be the same slope for any of these uh, curves that we're going to pass through. Notice we don't want to have to keep adjusting this thing depending on k, at least for our problem. So we have k equals x over y squared, so that means that our dy dx is equal to 1 over 2ky is actually equal to 1 over 2 times x over y squared instead of k, and we keep our y. So then y over y squared cancels one of them, so we just get one y in the denominator, but that's a denominator of a fraction. It's already in the denominator, so that goes to the numerator. And we keep our 2x. So now we have dy dx. Remember, that's for the family of curves. That's for all of these tangents. We want these guys, which are perpendicular. So that means that we want to take this dy dx for our family of curves, and we want to take the slope of the line perpendicular to it. And remember, to take a perpendicular slope, that's a negative reciprocal slope. So let's adjust dy dx to find dy dx for our family of orthogonal trajectories. So what we'll do is we will take dy dx which was equal to y over 2x, and we'll make that negative and flip it and get 2x over y. And now it's perpendicular to the curves. So we found the slope of the tangent line to the curves. Now we've got the slope of the tangent line to a curve that cuts through uh, perpendicular at every single curve. So what that looks like is something like this. Remember that uh, x equals ky squared are a bunch of x equals parabolas. So they look like this, or they could look, you know, if we have uh, negative parabolas, they could be upside down like that, or they could be a little bit wider, or they could be even more wide, depending on what the value of k is. So then our orthogonal trajectory comes in and it cuts through all these guys perpendicular. 
So we need something that cuts through every single one of these curves at a perpendicular angle, not depending on k. So what we did so far is we figured out that the slope of all of these tangents is y over 2x, and then we took the negative reciprocal and we figured out the slope of the tangents to the orthogonal trajectories would be negative 2x over y. So now let's um, solve this differential equation for our family of orthogonal trajectories for their slopes. So we've got dx will multiply both sides, we'll multiply both sides by y, so we get that the integral of y dx must be equal to the minus the integral of 2x dx. I'm just taking that minus out. And that's pretty easy to solve. We just get y squared over 2 plus c, we'll move it over, is equal to minus x squared plus c. Put all my c's on one side. So that means that my family of curves for my orthogonal trajectories are x squared plus y squared over 2 equals c, which is a family of ellipses. That should sort of make sense because if I draw the ellipses, notice that really is the curve that cuts through all of these guys in a perpendicular fashion. I cut through this curve perpendicular and this one and this one. The ellipse curves a little bit so that it can cut through every single one of these guys perpendicularly. And it doesn't depend on k, notice. A tank contains 20 kilograms of salt dissolved in 5,000 liters of water. Brine that contains 0.03 kilograms of salt per liter of water enters the tank at a rate of 25 liters per minute. The solution is kept thoroughly mixed and drains from the tank at the same rate. How much salt remains in the tank after half an hour? Well, first, how about we let uh, some function y of t be the kilograms of salt that are uh, dissolved after t minutes because the amount of salt in the tank dissolved after t minutes is uh, changing depending on the value of t. So once we have a function for the amount of salt dissolved, we can understand that from the context of this problem, it tank contains 20, grams of, uh, 20 kilograms of salt dissolved in the water to start with. So that means that our initial value problem is y of 0 equals 20. So we need some differential equation here, it seems, because we're looking for how much salt is going to be in the tank after half an hour. And all we have right now is rates. So if we look at the derivative of y with respect to time, that's the rate of change of the salt dissolved with respect to time. But there is salt that's coming into the tank because water is entering the tank in the form of brine, which has salt. and salt is being drained from the tank because solu the solution that's in the tank is just being drained or, um, at this uh, rate. So we have to think about the entire change of the uh, amount of salt dissolved. So dy dt will be the rate that salt is going in uh, minus the rate that salt is going out. So we have to look at both of those in order to build our differential equation. We can see that the rate that salt goes in is equal to our concentration of the salt that's going in times the rate that it's going in. So it looks like the brine has 0.03 kilograms of salt per liter. So we take 0.03, and that's kilograms per liter, but we don't want the liters. We don't want the water part, we only want the salt part. So we multiply that by the rate that it goes in, which is 25 liters per minute. Notice the liters over liters cancels and just gives us with the kilograms per minute, which is 0.75. So that's the rate at which salt is going in, and just salt. 
So let's see the rate that salt is going out. So the rate that salt is going out, well, we need the concentration of the salt going out, which is how many kilograms per liter. So y of t is the amount of salt dissolved after t minutes. So that's how much is going to be going out in kilograms. And then in liters, we've got, well, 5,000 liters of water. So that's our concentration of salt going out. Then the rate of salt going out, they said, was also 25 liters per minute. So we multiply through, and we get that this equals y of t over 200 kilograms per minute. So now we can build our differential equation. We can see that dy dt which is these two rates subtracted from each other, is 0.75 minus y of t over 200, which is equal to 150 minus y of t over 200. So this is a separable differential equation. We only have y, it looks like, which is great. We don't have to worry about t. So we just group all our y's together on one side, and we get that the integral of dy divided by 150 minus y is equal to the integral of dt over 200. We can just leave the 200 on either side, it doesn't really matter. And we get that this is minus the natural log of the absolute value of 150 minus y when we take our antiderivative. So we'll group all of our c's together on one side. And now we'll use our initial value, y of 0 equals 20, in order to identify the value of c. So we have y of 0 equals 20, which tells us that the minus the natural log of 130 is equal to c. Because notice the 150 minus uh, 20 is 130 is positive. I don't need the absolute value anymore. So now I know what c is. I can plug that in. So I get minus the natural log of the absolute value of 150 minus y is equal to t over 200 minus the natural log of 130. And that means that I can multiply both sides by negative 1 and raise each side to e. So I get that the absolute value of 150 minus y is equal to 130 times e to the minus t over 200. Notice that I do not need the absolute uh, value sign anymore, though, because y is continuous, it starts at 20, and this is never 0. Because even though it's a negative exponent, that's not going to make the expression negative. So I can get rid of the absolute value and just solve for y by itself by leaving everything positive. So I get y is equal to 150 minus 130 e to the minus t over 200. And I think we wanted to know how much salt remains after half an hour. So I'll plug in 30 minutes for t. And I get y of 30 is equal to 150 minus 130 e to the minus 30 over 200, which is about 38.1 kilograms.